This is Epicenter, episode 405, with guests Joe Andrews and Zach Williamson. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. My name is Sebastian Cuccio, and I'm here with Dave Oja, who is a new co-host uh, on the Epicenter team. So Dave is the co-founder of Osmosis. So he works very closely with Sunny. He's been working with Sunny for um, several years on like Sika and other projects. Uh, so Dave, welcome. Welcome to the Epicenter host roster. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, introduce yourself to the audience? Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, I'm Dave. So yeah, as uh, Spash mentioned, I'm a co-founder of Osmosis with Sunny. You know, who's also another co- uh, Epicenter host, which you should probably know. I also like run the proof stake validator Sika, which like, mainly validates you know, Cosmos chains, and that's I've been uh, working with Sunny for a number of years. With that I used to work on Tendermint Core and the Cosmos SDK, and I guess I'm now working both these actively again with Osmosis. Prior to Osmosis, I was like doing a lot of research on how to improve Snark recursion and like how to build Starks with a uh, Alessandro Chiesa and like many other great folks at UC Berkeley. So privacy and Snarks like you know very near and dear to my heart. So uh, I'm pretty excited to the podcast today with Aztec. Yeah, and it's uh, I think it's really fitting that you're here because today we're speaking with uh, Joe Andrews and Zach Williamson, uh, head of product and CTO at Aztec Protocol. And so we had Zach and Tom, another uh, team member, on the podcast in March of last year, and uh, so we're here for an update today. Thanks for joining us, guys. Oh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So before we talk to Joe and Zach about Aztec and uh, the evolutions for that project since we last had them on, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors for this week. With Paraswap, you can beat the bear market price with every single block. It's fast and highly liquid, and they've just integrated with Ledger. So if you're like me, if you're using a Ledger device, you can now swap directly in the Ledger Live app. So this makes it really easy to do swaps without having to connect your ledger to the browser. So check them out at paraswap.io. Are your assets sitting idly in your wallet? You can start earning rewards and contribute to network security by staking with Chorus One. As a staking provider securing over a billion dollars in assets on over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum, it's one of the most trusted staking providers in the ecosystem. If you're interested in running your own branded nodes, they have a managed white label node as a service offering which leverages Chorus's highly available and proven infrastructure enable you to participate directly in decentralized networks. Head over to Chorus.one to start your staking journey today. So since the last time we had you on, how's the company grown and you know what's been the evolution of Aztec uh, in the last year or so? Yeah, it, well, quite, quite a lot has happened in the last year. Um, I believe the last time we chatted, uh, we just published our um, latest uh, cryptography research um, uh, Plonk. Uh, and since then, we've put it into practice by releasing uh, the first uh, private um, layer two on Ethereum. Um, using that research, um, it's a network that allows users to shield Ethereum and other tokens uh, and send it privately. And that's been the, the, main, uh, the main focus of, of the company for the last year. And now we're now that that's done, we're moving on to a uh, bigger and slightly more meshes things that we yeah happy to dig into yeah, as well. Yeah, I mean, the last time you were on, we we talked a lot about you know how uh, the shielded transactions contract worked and like how that works for the user and also under the hood. Um, but we did talk about DeFi a little bit, and I think that you know you know looking at what you guys are doing now, that that's definitely like more on your radar. How has the growth in DeFi in the last year or so like helped shift your focus? Uh, has it, you know, was it was it an accelerator in shifting your focus more towards DeFi, or you know, were you already sort of on that track? Tell us about that journey. Yeah, definitely. So I think the explosive growth of DeFi really shifted our focus from focusing on kind of more Web two use cases, and it's created a market uh, for privacy on Web three. Um, so when DeFi was only kind of low tens or hundreds of millions, there wasn't that much of a, a need for privacy. Uh, but now we're in the kind of 50 to 100 billion uh, of market capital locked inside DeFi. There's a huge need for privacy there. So it's definitely shifted our focus and the product offering as well uh, and the network's capabilities to focus pretty much entirely on DeFi with the upcoming release. Cool. 
So for people who are not familiar with ASTAC, give us the high-level overview of you know, what you guys are working on, and we can kind of go from there. Sure thing. So ASTAC uses state-of-the-art cryptography to enable users to hide their identity when transacting on Ethereum. Right now, one of the main pro- we believe one of the main problems with transacting on blockchains is the fact that everything is public, which means that everything that you do, everything, every transaction that you make is viewable by the entire world. Now, this this isn't a necessarily huge, uh, much of a problem, and you know people that are just dabbling around with cryptocurrency. But when we're we're moving to a world where more and more financial transactions are being moved on chain because of its value as a settlement layer, it started to become a problem. It's going to be, in our opinion, the problem over the next few years with regards to blockchain. And so, uh, and and we're here to solve it. We use um, a niche branch of cryptography uh, called the zero knowledge proofs to enable users to prove the correctness of their transactions without having to actually leak critical information to the wider world. Things like their identity, the amounts they're transferring, the assets they're transferring. We're, yeah, we're steadily building out our technology and architecture to, to support more and more uh, use cases. What, what kind of use cases does this, this is open up? Because like shielded transactions are, are cool, you know, and you know, there's lots of different people, people working on that. Recently we had Tornado Cash. Uh, although they've got like a, I think like a quite different approach, but you know, what does a zero knowledge, like a zk zk roll up effectively? <laughs> what is what does that enable in terms of new types of use cases? I think this culminated in March with the the release of zk money, um, and zk money is the front end on top of our, our zk zk roll up, and it enables for the first time uh, an Ethereum transaction to exist. Fully privately, so you have ironclad privacy guarantees, very similar to the Zcash protocol. Uh, the circuits kind of use a similar underlying kind of set of nullifiers to get strong privacy guarantees. But for the first time, that transaction is actually cheaper than a layer one Ethereum transaction. So for for us, it's this seismic shift where users don't have to choose between privacy and kind of uh, being on Ethereum and being kind of in a, in a world where lots of people are building applications. You can have Kind of your cake and eat it, so to speak. You can have, have privacy, but on on the chain where there's the most developer activity. I can expand on that a little bit as well with regards to the zk zk rollup. At the core of um, a private transaction is the idea that well, instead of sending to the, the blockchain like the the basic information about your transaction, you know who you are, who you're sending has sending crypto to. Instead, you serve you send a, a zero knowledge proof. So basically, you say, well, here's my old encrypted balance and here's my new encrypted balance, and I can. Prove to you mathematically that uh, I follow the rules of the blockchain. You know, I've deducted something from my balance and added it to somebody else's balance. But I'm not going to tell you who I am, who I'm sending my money to, or how much my money was. However, zero knowledge proofs are very exp- uh, computationally expensive to check. Um, requires a lot of like niche um, cryptographic operations, which means that it costs a lot of gas. So the question, one of the questions is, how do you get? Well, in general, how do you get cheap transactions on Ethereum? But for us, the question is, how do you get cheap private transactions on Ethereum? And the solution is. Um, is uh, uh, a little bit uh, Inception-esque, but you you go on a little deeper. Instead of um, sending zero-knowledge proofs to, to the blockchain, which represent private transactions, you create a zero-knowledge proof, which proves the correctness of a large number of zero-knowledge proofs. And it allows you to send one kind of mega transaction to the Ethereum blockchain that proves the correctness of hundreds, if not thousands, of individual private transactions. And that's what a ZK, ZK roll-up is. Um, we, we've taken to calling it a private roll-up because it, it rolls off the tongue a little easier. So like you're doing one uh, zero knowledge proof of a bunch of transactions, but those transactions are themselves like using zero knowledge proofs to like be valid or like get privacy. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. So the, the, the entity creating that meta mega zero knowledge proof doesn't need to know any secret special information. So like, isn't this process like uh, starts just really expensive? So how is this being done or how is like, you know, this aggregator or I guess uh, sequencer uh, doing it? Like, be able to do it without a uh, high fees. Well, that's been that's been uh, that, that's the question, um, uh, and the something that we've been spending the last uh, two to three years focusing pretty intently on. And, and we we had to make s- s- several relatively significant advances in, in the state of the art when it comes to these kinds of crypto systems to get there. Um, specifically, we needed to create a zero knowledge proving system that was fast enough that you could make these gargantuan proofs. Because, uh, yeah, um, generally, if you want to 
create a zero knowledge proof of a computation, the act of making that proof is going to be about 100,000 to a million times um, slower than the original pre-construction. So, so actually verifying zero knowledge proofs inside of zero knowledge proof is one of these kind of um, computation nightmares. One of the one of the advantages that we have is, um, as 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 a company is what we, our chief scientist is uh, Ariel Gabazon. He's one of the best in the one of the best cryptographers in the industry. And together we've um, not just published the Plant Crypto System, which was one of the which is one of the, one of the an extremely fast um, zk snark, but we've been able to um, modify and update and and mold our proving system to to engineer it to be to be t um, tailored towards our specific needs. And so that meant that we have a lot of agency to um, make the proofing system particularly good for things like verifying zero knowledge proofs and doing um, very quite advanced and difficult computations. And that's that's really why why we've been able to to create this kind of construction on Ethereum. I believe currently that the it's the um, this this repository that we have is the the only one that's actually vi viable on the Ethereum blockchain, given the limited uh, cryptography you can do inside a smart contract. Super cool. I've definitely been following the story of Plonk. I remember when the paper first came out, it made like such huge waves during a what a snark temper of that year. Yeah. What's the story of the name Plonk? Like it's such an interesting name. Interesting is one way of putting it. Yeah. Um, so it, originally it was a placeholder name. Um, so we, Ariel and I were struggling to come up with a decent, with a, with a, with a name for the paper. And, and I, I suggested Plonk in, in, as, as a bit of a laugh. Um, Partially because, as you said, it was this this, this month's not temper. Like over the last few months in that in that year, twenty nineteen, quite a lot of um, seminal cryptography papers had been released, and quite a lot of them had like um, like ambitious names, you know, like um, powerful names, things like you know, um, Sonic or Darks and Starks and Marlin, and 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 I I just I felt like uh, it would be yeah I thought well, basically I thought it'd be funny to, to name it Plunk. Um, it's British slang for cheap low quality wine. Um, and I feel like uh, there's a lot of similarity because you know understand uh, you know get, getting getting to the bottom of, of Plonk requires making questionable life choices, a bit like uh, a bit like you know real Plonk and 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 you know it gives you a headache if you spend too much time with it. So <laughs> basically, okay, so basically we, we call it Plonk. We publish it to ePrint. Generally, ePrint takes like a week or so. Like ePrint is this big um, like like um, a website that is a repository of cryptography papers. And generally, it takes them about a week or so to to um, approve a paper for release. So we thought, hey, let's just publish it now and deal with the name later. Um, but they published this one overnight. And then people started tweeting about it and saying, hey, what's this punk thing? And so ba basically, the kind of word got out about it. And we figured it was a bit too late to change it. And, you know, it was kind of funny. So <laughs> here we are today. But it got kind of like backwards name, right? Like because I, oh I was, yes, yes, it's got a, it's, yeah. So yes, um, I think one one of the only useful, um, well, not useful. One of the only, one of the one of the main skills that I picked up from uh, a, a degree in particle physics was uh, elaborately named acronyms. So it stands for permutations um, over the Lagrange base. That's the P and the L for uh, ecumenical, um, which means all encompassing, uh, non interactive arguments of knowledge, and the A is silent. That's great. <laughs> I, I love it. I hope we can push for snorks as a word instead of starks. I don't know if we've lost this one though. <laughs> Ocumenical instead yeah, of uh, it's, a. Farm. I mean, it's it, it would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, we've got a few years of inertia to push back against, unfortunately. So, so last time you were on, we we, we talked about DeFi, and I, I, before we did this interview, I, I listened to 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 that episode, and you know, one of the things that we talked about was you know privacy and DeFi, and you know, you you mentioned that uh, privacy makes DeFi paranoid, and the way you describe that is you know, by uh, by using uh, by using uh, Maker as an example. Could you elaborate on what you meant there, and you know how privacy, you know, more more broadly, uh, or at least privacy te technologies, you know, break certain applications in DeFi? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... So yeah, to expand on, on that um, uh, par paranoia. So, what basically the question? One of the questions which is relevant when it, when it comes to privacy, private transactions is how how on the basis do you make a private DeFi protocol? Because it would be really nice to have a private version of Maker where you can make a CDP and uh, nobody knows how much it is. Uh, and it would be nice to do things like have a private, fully private decentralized exchange where you have a private order book, but you can still match trades. But the problem with these approaches is that um, in a private world, um, you can't have public state. 
because modifying a public vari public state variable leaks information about what you're doing. For example, things like Uniswap. You, for Uniswap, you need to understand the total amount, the total supply you have of a given asset to perform to understand how much liquidity you have. And so, if you deposit into a liquidity pool, then you're changing the total amount of liquidity. That's public variable, so people can see what you've deposited. That's not private. Um, similarly, for MakerDAO, if you create a uh, collateralized debt position, that's private. That means it's encrypted. And so, how in the blazes is anybody supposed to figure out if you're becoming under collateralized? And if they are, how are they supposed to liquidate your position? Because it's encrypted. Only only the CDB creator knows how to decrypt it, and they're not going to help you liquidate their position. So. That's one of the fundamental problems um, with, with with privacy, uh, and the paranoia comes from, for example, you could create a private maker DAO where you know you have a CDP where the where the CDP creator has to constantly kind of send effectively proofs of life. They have to continuously prove that their CDP is over collateralized because they're the only person who can create those proofs. And if, if they don't serve the proof, this proof of life in you know like a day or two, then they get then, then something bad happens to their position. And so there there are ways of getting around this we we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't think that we could uh we could provide practical and valuable privacy to defi the the holy grail solution is um to use multi party computations where for example if you want to if you want a for example a decentralized exchange with a private order book but you can still match trades amongst people in theory you can do that through multi party computations where you have like a ring of individuals they all have their own orders and prices that are all encrypted and they slowly Engage in these NPCs with one another to to kind of um, drip feed information about their orders to counterparties that have matching orders, and in aggregate you can you can achieve very high quality high quality privacy with these kinds of approaches. However, the complexity of these approaches is is absolutely enormous, and we're nowhere near uh, the point today where you can you can bootstrap these kinds of these kinds of protocols. You know, hardly any, there's hardly anybody in the world who can who can develop them. Um, to be efficient enough to work, and and so you don't you don't have that kind of that mass appeal that you have with Ethereum, where you know anyone can code up a smart contract. But we do have a much simpler solution for privacy uh, when it comes to de to DeFi, um, which uh, we could expand on um, if that would be. A, uh, I don't want to preempt any questions there. Please go ahead. Let, explain. So yeah. So how <laughs> do you okay? So how do you how do you how do you get private DeFi? Well, the 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 simple answer is you don't. Um, basically, you leave, you make, you keep the DeFi protocols public. You know, Uniswap, make a DAO, you leave them where they are. You know, hanging out on layer one, completely public. Everyone can see what's going on. And what you do is you make the assets private. You ensure that individuals have uh, that their holdings of various cryptocurrencies is anonymous. So, if, for example, let's consider the, the make a DAO position again. Imagine, you know, you know, make those public so you can see. When a CDP is created, you can see its value. You can see when it comes under collateralized and liquidated, but you don't know who holds it, and that's very high quality privacy because at that I mean it could be anybody. And so the most important thing isn't to, in, in our opinion, to make the 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 DeFi protocols private. It's not to make the 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 um the, effectively like the sites which interact with the value private. The important thing is to make the value holders private and give them anonym anonymity, and. And that's how we're planning on doing and on on achieving privacy. So it's like a you have you hide all the addresses, then you kind of publicly when you do a trade, you, it's what's public is that a it, this amount is going from some address that has some the right thing does public action, and it goes back to a new like private exactly, address. Exactly. Yeah. So you can see you know you know you can see like you know ten ten for example like you know ten ETH has gone from address question mark question mark question mark has gone into Uniswap. Got out a bunch of dollars, and that's gone back to address question mark question mark question mark, and um, so that kind of quite we think quite effectively solves the problem. You know, these these protocols can can still exist in all the all of their magnificent complexity um, without having to kind of re rewrite rewrite themselves to be private. But you still get the, the benefits of privacy that users care about. I've got an analogy if it would be uh, helpful for for the listeners. Internally, we we call it the DeFi bus. Um, so you, you kind of see the the Aztec roll up contract as being like a a bus station, and there's all these buses that have kind of tinted windows, and you can see the front of the bus. It says, "I'm going to Uniswap to swap beef dye," and people can get on the bus. Um, and you can't see who's getting on the bus, but it it will go to Uniswap, uh, take the ETH to Uniswap, and then it will bring back uh, a load of dye on on the return journey of the bus. And give it back to the users in the asset network. Um, so, so I think it's a good analogy for kind of uh, showing how this network interacts with the rest of the the DeFi ecosystem, and whilst whilst giving strong privacy guarantees to everyone who's on that bus or 
in that transaction. So from a user perspective, I just want to like walk us, as, as I understand it, walk through the transaction flow here. I want to trade on Uniswap. In order to do that, let's say I want to trade like ETH for DAI. I send the ETH to the Aztec contract. I get into the bus, effectively. Then that trade gets made, and then I'll get, say, DAI back at some point. Couldn't someone just be watching my address and see that I interacted with the contract? I interacted with, as you call it, this Uniswap bus and just deduct that I've just made a trade on Uniswap? I mean... So it's a bit more, it's, uh, it's a bit kind of, if you did a direct deposit like that um, in the same transaction, there would be kind of a way to link your layer one address to to that trade. But the, the flow actually is a bit more, um, it's kind of one more step. So users have funds already on the Aztec network, so they're already shielded. Um, so you would have uh, in a separate transaction, you would take your ETH and you would make it ZK ETH. Uh, and then you have uh, these encrypted UTXO notes on Aztec and you can use those to interact with any L1 smart contract through our DeFi bridge. Uh, so in this case, you're you're choosing to interact, interact with the Uniswap uh, ETH DAI pool. Uh, so you kind of send a transaction that says, I want to put one ETH uh, into the next uh, bus going to the to that pool. Uh, and the owner of that ETH could be anyone who's ever deposited ETH to the uh, Aztec smart contract. So your identity is completely hidden throughout that process. Uh, the roll-up provider will then bundle all those transactions with any other user who wants to do the same trade. Uh, so say Zach also wants to trade two ETH and a few other people are, are also getting on the bus. So we'll send an aggregate then transaction from the roll-up contract out to Uniswap, say five ETH in total, and we'll bring back DAI to uh, the Aztec roll-up contract. And that will then be dispersed in zero knowledge notes to the holders who participated kind of in, in that transaction. So you're actually not getting the proceeds of the DeFi interaction on layer one, you're getting it in encrypted form on layer two, uh, which is how the strong privacy guarantees uh, kind of maintain through that. I think it's quite an interesting way of doing it. And Zach can talk about the actual cryptography because it, it was a bit of a breakthrough moment for us to actually get the, the identities hidden through the process. Hmm. Okay, so it uses the same note system as like the previous version. I think that's what I missed. Uh, the note system's actually not graded form because the, the old Aztec uh, just had confidential notes. So here, uh, both the balance and the owner is encrypted. Um, so that's what gives us kind of the, the anonymity we need to, to do these transactions. How is this looking like from a user perspective? Like, you know, right now, uh, as a connect bed, I'm asking yourself to website and I just you know, kind of press a button to do a transaction. So is it like, uh, sim is it still pretty similar where on, um, on like the Aztec uh, site, there's still a way to connect my wallet and just do the trade that, uh, do the transaction that like does all these three steps, like go to L1, swap and go back to L2. Yeah, so, so we have a kind of, we call it ZK money and it's kind of like a showcase of what's possible with the Aztec SDK. Um, so in the next kind of three months, the, the main venue for these trades will be ZK money uh, and you'll be able to connect MetaMask kind of, it will show you either if you have on layer one, or if you've already kind of used the Aztec network, it will show you a ZK ETH, and you'll be able to kind of do these various uh, DeFi interactions. And yeah, all of that will be abstracted from the user uh, via SDK. The kind of three to six month goal is um, the SDK is integrated uh, on a lot of these uh, L1 front end protocols. Uh, so you can actually just go directly to uh, Uniswap or Aave or some of those protocols and, and perform, uh, have the option to perform the interaction privately. Very cool. Uh, I feel like this general approach is like the future of like practical privacy for uh, DeFi things. It's often like you, you, you know, if you want public information, like you know, constant product market makers or constant function, uh, then you have to like have the swaps be public. Hundred percent. Yeah, I think it's kind of the best of both worlds because you get the kind of the transparency of uh, layer one DeFi, which is kind of what's made it grow to be uh, so popular. But you also don't have to sacrifice what a lot of people take for granted in the Web2 world is just basic transaction privacy. Um, no one can see my Robinhood account. No one can see kind of my, my Revolut account. So I think this allows new types of kind of user experiences um, that give you the best of, uh, I think, L1 DeFi, but also strong user privacy guarantees. Yeah, sorry, I just want to like uh, stay on this DeFi topic a bit. So in, in that case, then... Uh, you you need to create. I mean, like Uniswap would need to add a uh, 
like uh, Aztec ETH, uh, Aztec DAI uh, pair, I suppose. And if you wanted to uh, trade those assets, that's one of the one of the key parts of our approach. Is that um, we, we're looking at the, the 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 kind of the evolving layer two landscape, and right now, uh, kind of the the impetus is on having split liquidity because if you want to benefit from the um, the fee reductions that you get from operating on layer two, you've got to move the, the actual DeFi protocol into the layer two. And it has its own liquidity pool, it has its own um, liquid asset pairings, et cetera. But for us, we we felt it, we wanted it to uh, be very much felt like what, what users want is to leave the the actual the sources of liquidity on layer one, because that's where they're going to get the, the best prices, but interact with it cheaply. And so even if you, if you have shielded Aztec assets and you're using our DeFi bridge to interact with a, with an L1 smart contract like Uniswap, you're still talking to the Uniswap's layer one liquidity pool. So the ETH to die pairing that you're getting and, and the associated price, it's still you're, you're, it's still based around the global Uniswap pool. So in order to perform an like an, perform an integration with Aztec, you 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 need a you need some kind of facility ability to shield user funds using the Aztec network, but that won't materially affect pr the the price that they're getting um, from using our protocol. Okay, interesting. What what about um, collateralization? How, how how would collateralization work uh, using Aztec for CDPs? Do you mean? Yeah, like make like uh, like a CDP, for example. Yeah, it's so uh, there's two there's two methods really. You can have a SAC uh, kind of uh, mentioned earlier on, like a unique CDP for you, where you you don't really benefit from huge gas savings, but you have uh, strong privacy guarantees. Or you can have kind of tier CDPs. So you can kind of have a, a system where uh, we all agree with a load, 100 other users that we want to enter into a, a three month term uh, CDP and, and the LTV ratios can be kept at a certain um, amount. And then everyone's kind of doing the same thing. So you can get pretty strong uh, gas savings as well as privacy savings from doing that. So it depends on kind of the, the end user product. Um, we're starting to see a lot more fixed rate kind of protocols come online in DeFi. So I think that's where I think the kind of uh, retail users will end up is kind of on, on more structured products rather than uh, wildly, wildly swinging um, pools. Um, but that, that's kind of, I think, the approach that we take with um, collateralization of, of loans. Sorry, I think I didn't, I didn't quite follow. Like, are, are you imagining that the collateral is held like can just like one big collateral pool held by the uh, contract or imagine that there's somehow like a, and like my share of the pool is private, but handled on the roll up side. Yeah. So you could have like a Aztec uh, Q4 uh, e CDP uh, and, and you could have different uh, collateralization ratios. So this would be the 100, 150% collateralization ratio. We'd all enter on a certain date and it would be a three month term uh, and, and kind of that would be one approach to doing it. Um, and in, in that case, you get like a, a much better uh, gas cost per user um, of actually taking out that uh, form of um, that form of debt. Or you could have the case where if you're a large user and you don't mind paying uh, kind of the L1 gas fees yourself, you can just have free flexibility by entering in kind of uh, any CDP of your choosing, uh, but you wouldn't get any batching in that uh, circumstance. You'd still get batching on the cost of privacy. Um, so you'd be able to have your uh, transaction batched with other um, zero knowledge snarks that are doing different things, but you would pay the full cost of the uh, entering the CDP position. Um, so you get kind of a bit of scaling in terms of privacy. So, oh, so it's still fine to like hold the collateral in this, uh, or sorry, you have the uh, loaned amount being you know, in this private uh, Aztec L2 list, but just collateral has got to be on chain since uh, yep, you, you need liquidation to be able to see it? Or Yeah, so in that case, it would be like, in a single user case, it would be like a smart contract would own the position, and that smart contract would be like a create two uh, opcode, so you'd have kind of a, a, a new smart contract for every uh, kind of CDP that was created, where there was just one user uh, kind of behind that CDP. It's just the source of funds that do the initial collateralization are coming from the Aztec network, not from kind of a, a tainted L1 address. Very cool. On this like privacy idea, uh, so I remember like Zcash, there's this problem of uh, people would go from the transparent pool into the shielded pool, and then it kind of almost immediately go from shielded pool back to transparent. Or in this case, it'd be like shielded pool to uh, Uniswap trade, the exact same balance. How, how are you thinking of like uh, mitigating like 
the linkability there of like just exact amounts. Yeah, it's it's uh, like if you use a full amount. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's it's a big problem, and it's an, part of it is an education issue, and part of it is a UX and design issue. Um, because what it, what because of the this privacy tech is still relatively new, I think a lot of users don't fully understand how it works, and that you that effectively your by when you shield your tokens, your um the act of de- of that of depositing into the shielded pool is public, so they can see, for example, that you know Dave puts ten ETH into Aztec, and um but and then. And so, if you then immediately withdraw, it's very easy. What's happened? You know, if you see, uh, if you see Dave's deposited ten ETH into Aztec, and then in the next block, Dave withdraws ten ETH from Aztec. It's, I mean, yeah, it's it's kind of obvious. But um, what you really need to do is deposit your value into Aztec, wait a little bit, and then withdraw to a different address, your the one you originally deposited from. Um, because let's say, because we we try to encourage. Um, through our, through our UI, UI, people to deposit in relatively fixed amounts, like one tenth. So the way it would ideally work, like if you're if you're for for an educated user, is you deposit tenth into Aztec. You know, you wait a few hours, and then to a different address, you withdraw the tenth into Aztec, and that tenth could have come from like anybody who, like you know, from from now to the dawn of the pro- start, start of the protocol, deposited tenth into Aztec or or acquired tenth within the Aztec network somehow, perhaps through DeFi. But most of it, I think, is just making sure in the in the in the user interface that the user is informed of what they're doing, and so that if they're um, if they do this this flow where you immediately deposit and withdraw, then the UI goes, you know, hey, you sure you want to do this? And Joe, I think you can you can expand on that a bit. Yeah, there's a few cases, um, but we're kind of touting this idea of a privacy score, um, so kind of just really helping to inform the user of how private a, a transaction they're about to do is, and as Zach was saying. That can be anything from hey you're, you're you're unshielding to the same address you deposited from that's that's not private um, or there's a high linkability risk there or things like if you're kind of unshielding to a very large significant uh, number of decimal places um, then that's also kind of can add to the, the linkability uh, of those transactions. The great thing about the kind of the DeFi bridge I mean, it doesn't fix all of these things but it, it it's the first step in in the road is that privacy kind of starts to become by default not opt-in and i think the 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 issue with some like other privacy systems is that when you have to choose between privacy and uh, not having it traditionally the user experience has always been worse or or always been more expensive so it's always been the incentive is to get out of the privacy shield and what we're trying to do with with the next couple of versions of aztec is change that uh, and flip it on its head so that users should be comfortable keeping their funds in the aztec network and then those kind of opportunities for a privacy breach should become a bit more reduced but you still have to kind of be a bit careful when you're interacting with the DeFi bridge if you kind of deposit i don't know 90 percent of one token to the, the aztec network and then there's a DeFi bridge trade for 90 percent of that that token uh you can kind of start to p- figure out uh what's happening but where, where the DeFi bridge i think comes into its own is if if you have kind of smaller uh trades that are drip fed into the market over time if that trade is kind of um pretty uh, homogeneous compared to like the the normal size of a transaction on the network uh, for that asset pair you have great privacy and and that's what uh the ui will kind of enforce um and try to guide the user around with a privacy score oh that's very cool so you're like detecting these uh cases where you, you think it's easy to like you know link back and then just giving a warning right then and saying look this transaction uh is likely linkable maybe you want to break it up or wait some more time yeah, that's, that's the idea. And I think like on, on day one, it may be kind of just like one of those password indicators uh, that's kind of like strong, weak uh, uh, or kind of uh, extra strong. But um, we're working on kind of the metrics to put into it right now. But I think that's I think that's the easiest way that to, to identify the user of, of a potential issue, um, because a lot of this is just user experience. It's you haven't had to think about this um, in a Web two world because uh, you have kind of privacy from everyone except your service provider. But in a in a Web three world, there are kind of these different cases where you do need to kind of be notified, and users have to kind of accept different norms. And I think it's on apps and applications to start to think of better u- user experiences to notify what data is public and uh, who can see what. And this is just one thing we're trying. Very cool. And I guess uh, this is also the sort of thing where uh, the amount of warnings you get really goes down over time as more assets or more like, historical records are there to be like selecting from. Definitely, yeah. 
um, yeah, as, as the kind of privacy set grows, um, you should see less and less warnings and, uh, yeah, the, the kind of network effect around, uh, privacy in the Aztec network grows stronger. And I think also the, the amount of times you want to kind of leave the Aztec network will also kind of shrink. Uh, so you should kind of have less of these, these opportunities to accidentally break your privacy. I think we can, we can talk a bit more about like how we get past kind of DeFi and, and the longer term goal. And that would kind of, explain a bit more about kind of how Noir fits into all of this and, and how uh, long-term we think a lot of lot more applications will happen within the network. So there'll be less and less chances for those privacy breaches. Yeah, sure. Uh, just do you want to talk about how you're imagining uh, Noir and uh, more privacy or more applications on the private side? Yeah, so this is this this kind of DeFi bridge thing we're building is is merely the the a stepping stone to our, our our kind of our grander aspirations. It's an architecture that we're calling like the working title is Elastic Three, where right now with what we released in March, you can shield cryptocurrencies, you can sell them privately in a unilateral way, which is it's useful, but it's 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 um, doesn't really tap into the massive ecosystem of innovation. That's happening in, in in the blockchain space, which is where the DeFi bridge comes in. But even that only provides um, it provides good access to public layer one protocols. But where we think privacy really starts to shine is that it opens up a whole new category of interactions that just can't exist today on a blockchain because of the because so many so many applications in, for example, like traditional finance or payments or um, like um, the kind of use cases that in, like it, everyday individuals desire require strong user privacy guarantees. And so what we want to do is, is effectively recreate the Ethereum smart contract ecosystem inside Aztec, but where privacy is preserved. So that to give developers, engineers, users the ability to write their own smart contracts that have privacy baked into the core so that you can just, so not just, so you can't, it's not just that you can have a private token, but you can decide how it's transferred, who can own it, how to mint it, how to settle it. Because what this really enables and what this what really excites us is that this is the first time that you can meaningfully put your identity on chain and link it to your cryptocurrency accounts without splashing your personal information all over the internet. It means that you can conditionally prove parts about yourself without revealing that to anybody else in the wider world. Um, for example, you know, you can have um um, you know, an identity token um, that you that you can have some some uh, a cryptocurrency that's conditioned that's um, yeah, holding as conditional on having one of these identity tokens, or even more um, like more. You, it also opens up like more, more other innovative spaces, like for example, um, private NFTs, where you know you can have some data fields that are private, but you can like um, prove parts about your 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 private NFT um, to, to to other people under certain conditions. Um, you can have it opens up a whole um, innovative tranche of blockchain-based uh, games where you can have meaningful, where you can actually have information asymmetry. So you know the players of the game actually can um, not know things about their um, about their counterparts, which isn't really the case with with a with a fully transparent setting. But all of these things require programmability. It requires the the community to decide how they best want privacy to be used in their applications and to be and to have the tools and ability to program it themselves. And that's where Noir and Aztec three comes in. Noir is our highly efficient ZK smart programming language spearheaded by, um, by, uh, by, by, by Kev, um, Kev Federbaum. And it's, um, it's a, it's a Rust based syntax language that compiles directly to highly optimized, uh, plonk circuits. And we're planning on using that in the, in, in a, in a, in, in the kind of the next iteration of our protocol design, where instead of our kind of ZK, ZK roll up verifying the same transaction type over and over and over again. This 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 like private transactions, private transactions, private transactions. Instead, what the role that verifies is a a, um, a, a zero knowledge proof that's over that's come from a from a, one of these circuits that's been written in Noir and uploaded into our network by anybody. Basically, it, it's it's the Noir's the keystone technology which allows us to create a fully permissionless private programmable cryptocurrency network um, and. That's yeah. That's pretty much w once once we're at, once we've put out the DeFi pitch, That's where we're that's where we're heading um, with all our all our energy and attention and resources. Well, very cool. I want to unpack it because there's a bunch of components there. So like for so the programmability idea is like I want to be able to put my. It's kind of is it like the Zexy model where uh, I guess 
you're from the there's a couple of things trying to do that where you have a public or you have like a program on chain or on the Invastec chain that users can interact with in sort of a private manner where this the contract can maintain both the public state and private state and you know every interaction just updates both of these. Yes, exactly. Um, but where where I think things things differ is is the fact that what we've been very much trying to um, uh, structure this architecture to look a lot more like a a systems platform that would be more that would be familiar to software engineers. So um, it like, to, to to kind of eight familiar blockchain concepts like you have a when you're creating these transactions you have a concept of a call stack you have contracts that can call all the contracts you can have one contract with multiple functions and you can kind of have um, re reasonably like somewhat arbitrary tra like um, transaction depth. So you can have, uh, you know, contract pass people calling contracts, calling other contracts, calling other contracts over and over and over again. You don't have the um, some of the restrictions that that other other systems have, like Zexy, because of the um, well, the, their restrictions come down to the fact that the the, the protocol was designed for this kind of um, limited recursion technology that was available at the time, and think things have um, moved along a bit, like a little bit, like there's been a lot of development on these, like on, on cycles of elliptic curves uh, with this halo recursion system with the stuff that Asics doing, which means you can have this kind of arbitrary depth recursion where, um, where you, know, you can have, you know, ZK proofs, verifying ZK proofs, verifying ZK proofs all the way down. And this enables, yeah, it, it enables your, your, your ZK snark circuit to encode an algorithm which starts to look a lot like a uh, VM based cryptocurrency protocol. Where you don't have to like learn new and like kind of a diff uh, oblique different types of um, transaction semantics in order to program it. Oh, cool! So it's like starting to look more like base layer ETH, where it's solving the old problem of uh, I can really only interact with one contract or like a small set in one transaction because just limited uh, proving tech for certain curves. But now you're saying like with the Aztec you know, unbounded recursion, and it, this is like fixed. You can now. Uh, in theory, I'm going to throw my hands up here. We've not built it yet. <laughs> so um, the, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the mission for our company is putting this in practice over the next 12 months. Cool. Uh, I guess a question, maybe this is a bit technical for folks, but like, uh, how does the proving work here? Where essentially you're, you're having, uh, suppose you have this like large, suppose you want multiple transactions interacting with the same contract per block, but they all affect state. Do you have some like out off chain aggregator, like, bundle these together and make one proof? Or is there some parts that are like available to the block proposer for them to do the proofs to get many transactions to one contract per block? No, it's a, it's a good question because you, you do run into some some uh, so-called like race conditions when you're when you're dealing with these kind of off-chain aggregation services, particularly with the private um, with when protecting privacy, where if you have um, multiple individuals who want to talk to the same contract, then they're kind of that they, they want to up. They're, they're effectively modifying the same database, and you can kind of get into problems with uh, you know lots of people kind of. It's a bit like lots of people wrestling over the same the, the, like uh, over, over 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 a single piece of cake and going you know I want this cake I want this cake. Um, I don't know that's a great way of describing a race condition, but um, there's there's a fairly simple, straightforward way of solving um, that, which is basically to have this aggregator be the entity performing state updates so that um, when individuals send transactions to the aggregator, they they request state updates to be made on their behalf. Um, and if they're private, then they'll be encrypted. If they're public, they won't be. But it's actually the the the, the aggregator who's doing the, doing the mechanical process of putting these variables inside data, inside a database, modifying those database values. Um, so yeah, I think, I think at this point, it's a relatively solved problem. Okay, so it's not really a privacy leak in that uh, the aggregator already accessed the private database, sort of like the private state. So that's like there's no new information they're getting. Exactly. They're, I mean, if the aggregator, you're, you're, you're basically um, when you create your privacy proof, um, that that proof will spit out a bunch of um, variables, but they're all encrypted, um, and those variables need to be added into a database. But the the, the aggregator doesn't have like doesn't know anything about those those variables For, to them. They just look like random numbers. Oh, wait, they don't need to know these random the actual uh, data entries to handle state conflicts. Well, the idea is basically you don't you don't have a state conflict. So, well, this may be getting into the weeds, but um, dealing with private state and public state, um, uh, they need to be treated differently. So, with private, the, the way the way one handles private state modifications is 
you well um, using um, this kind of this Bitcoin style unspent transaction object. The idea is uh, instead of having a like an a, like an account where you you have um uh, like something like a balance which you can modify over time, you instead have um, these 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 notes that you can either be created or destroyed. And so the base so this makes the the state model quite simple because a note can either exist or doesn't exist. It can't change value. Um, and so if you want to perform a state update um, for, if, as, a, as a user, you want to create some private state variables, then you basically you, you basically you want to create a bunch of these UTXO nodes and you want to and you want to delete um, a bunch of existing UTXO nodes. And so basically you go to the aggregation, you go, hey, I want to make these UTXO nodes and I want to delete this, these other like UTXO nodes. But the key thing here is that they're all encrypted. Um, the, the notes you'll be being created are encrypted and the notes you're destroying, they are they're, they're encrypted too. But they're encrypted. But that this is really getting used to weeds, and I think maybe, maybe is is uh, I'm going to struggle to explain this properly uh, in, in the time we have available. But um, the, the basic idea is when you want to destroy um, a note in Aztec, the way we mark, we record a note as being destroyed uses a different encryption algorithm to the way that we record a note being created. So basically, the, the mark in our in our kind of ledger which says a note has been destroyed uses a different encryption algorithm to the mark in our ledger which says a note has been created. So you can't ever um, Link it like a destroy notification to a create notification. Oh, cool! So it's like you're making everyone has to do UTXOs. These private contracts define like validity predicates to the UTXOs. But then when you do a transaction, the new UTXOs get created. But you break the linkage like intra batch between inputs and outputs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a very it's, it's extremely similar to, to, to how Zcash handled it. Um, I think they were they were very much kind of trailblazers on this with this regards. Cool. So, okay. So then, like, Noir is fitting into this by uh, making this like DSL for uh, folks to be able to write these uh, contracts that like, are in this UTXO model and compile to programs. Exactly. So, so Noir, Noir is um, g going to have quite a lot of layers to it um, because, like, the first the first thing that Noir needs to solve is that um, these programs that people are creating need to be turned into extremely efficient zero knowledge proofs because. One of the main problems with zero knowledge cryptography is constructing these proofs is generally quite slow. As I said, it's like a like factor of 100k to a million times slower than running a computation. Now, one of the ways that this is can be solved is by delegating proof construction to third parties. So a lot of scaling solutions that don't that aren't private um, take this approach because it's a bit of a no-brainer. You know, it's hard computation to do. Well, just send it off to you know 132 core AWS machines, and then it'll you'll you'll get it done in a few seconds. But because we'd ha we're dealing with private transactions, you can't delegate proof construction to a third party because then you're leaking information and secrets to that third party. So, in, so effectively, all of these programs that are being created in Noir, they're all being turned into zero knowledge proofs that where the proof construction is happening, be made directly by the user, you know, by people with old laptops, crummy phones, um, and so you're very constrained in in, in how much horsepower you have available, which is why it needs to be efficient, which is why we developed a ton of like um, advances with our, with our proving systems. And then, so not, but then you've also got to uh, make this thing easier to program, which means you've got to have the abstract kind of uh, smart contract semantics, state modification semantics, um, you know, uh, and all of that associated paraphernalia that's easy to understand to, to the user. And so that, um, to like, to be completely transparent, that is still very much a work in progress. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be arrogant enough to say we've solved that problem yet, but um, but I have, but I have every confidence that, that we will. I mean, it. Yeah, I think the first step is 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 abstracting the cryptography from from the developer, and then the second step is kind of uh, baking in more functionality, and that's where the kind of the bit we're working on. But at the moment, you can kind of use Noir to just uh, kind of write a a snark circuit, um, but it doesn't really fit in with the rest of the kind of Aztec uh, roll-up ecosystem. So that's kind of the next focus of the company post Devo Bridge is to is to build that that part of things. But the the actual language kind of early syntax is is written, and we're 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 actively getting feedback on it right now as kind of a a new way to write snark or plonk circuits. How important is is all this to? Uh, I mean, it's sort of broader adoption of zero knowledge technologies, you know, in and outside of crypto, I guess, um, or like privacy preserving technologies. Like I think if you take the average web developer, like, or even iPhone developer or whatever, a lot, I think a lot of these, these developers have very little understanding of how zero knowledge technologies work and how to implement them. And so how, how important do you think this, this work is to 
sort of broadening the scope of use cases for, for zero knowledge tech? I mean, I think it's foundational. I mean, we just just have to we have to just have to look at why Ethereum became so successful. It was because anyone could write a smart contract. Um, you know, you have this incredibly powerful technology, this just this distributed ledger that suddenly stopped becoming. The, it wasn't this kind of this 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 incredibly um, difficult concept to wrap your head around and difficult to to to, to interact with. But instead, it went, it went from that to going like, you know, here's how you make a, t- a cryptocurrency token in three lines of Solidity code, or, or how many, however many it was. Um, and it was very easy to access. And I, I think it's absolutely essential to, to propagate zero knowledge proofs and this kind of crypto- cryptography to a wider audience. You got to you got to explain it in terms that people understand that are familiar to them. And you got to abstract the cryptography away. As you said, people, most people are we're probably say quite rightly, like incredibly intimidated by this cryptography. Um, and, uh, you know, there's the, the very common old adage, you know, don't roll your own crypto, don't roll your own crypto, it'll end badly. And I, <laughs> I say it as a cryptographer. So creating an abstraction layer, which presents very complicated crypto systems as easy to understand programming languages with clearly understandable semantics, where the where you know that whatever you produce, the cryptography behind it will be sound and secure is absolutely uh, essential for the for the wide scale adoption of this technology. Mm. And what are the risks here? Because, uh, you know, we've seen in in crypto that you know uh, that bugs can be catastrophic. Um, we've also seen so the cascading effects of you know layers upon layers of dependencies. You know, breaking. Like large scale applications on the web, like recently with like all this NPM kind of stuff, uh, stuff happening around there. If for for a developer, and I'm, I'm speaking mostly like developers outside of crypto, but even like people coming into crypto and who are like some background of development. How do we ensure that you know they use cryptography responsibly and that they're using the right that they're using libraries that are you know vetted and audited and you know even if they're Developing at a higher level of, of abstraction, but that you know someone doesn't use like a cryptography library and like to build I don't know some kind of messaging app for example and like exposes everyone's messages uh, or like something catastrophic like this right like what's the what's the right balance of like expertise to you know, general availability or that, that we're looking for here? It's a good question, and I'm not sure it's one with a with a particularly easy answer because. Like the risks are real. I'm not going to try and trivialize what, what we're doing here. I mean, the complexity, the amount of complexity involved in these advanced crypto systems is absolutely astronomical. And then if you add on the, the complexity of a very complicated systems level architecture that someone's building using tools that have been developed to turn it into a, into a, like into a zero knowledge proof, then there are certainly risks there. But, um, I think that. It's it's going it's going to be an evolving process, you know. I do think that it's obviously there, there are there are some basic things you can do, right? I mean, like you can make sure that at every layer your your, your technology stack has been fully audited, and that you know it's been written by the people who are the experts in their fields. You know, like we, we're, we're very lucky in Aztec to have RL Gabazon as like uh, you know to be able like to able to 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 help us with like internal uh, audits, which to be honest, before we really start, um, our, our primary audit did reveal um, several security issues that we that, that were resolved because I guess this is complicated beating us stuff and it's very, very, very easy to get it wrong. So I do think that there's going to have to be a, 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 a period of time where once these kind of these these advanced abstraction layers, these, these programming languages start to become easy to easy to use and more widespread, that they will need to be approached with caution. Because uh, I think like like we've seen with the adoption of Ethereum, sometimes the only the only cure is time, right? Like a, a lot of like I don't think I'm I'm being uh, unfair when I say that like the Solidity smart contract programming, which is widely considered to be you know somewhat insecure, like it's not. If you were to do the if you were going to rewrite a three more over again from scratch, you would design Solidity in a very different way to make it a lot more secure to program. But obviously, back in 2015, you know, Gavin Wood was doing this for the first time, you know, so it, it's so nobody was aware of the issues that would result. But that being said, today in 2021. I would argue that if you're going to write a smart contract, Solidity is the best language to write it in because it's been battle tested, and these bugs, these exploits, these problems that have been, um, you know, found out. Unfortunately, sometimes through 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 hacks and attacks, but it means that you have this this, this large kind of anthology of uh, security practices and principles to draw on. Now we don't have those for for zk start programming languages because they're completely new and they're in their infancy, and that book will have to be written. 
And there's a question about like how many, how how much of that book is going to have to be written is going to be written ahead of time through thoughtful and um, careful deliberation of how these systems are built, and how much of that book is going to have to be written effectively, you know, in cash from people losing money through hacks and exploits. Uh, and yeah, it's something that's very much on our mind. But I, I think the the only thing you could do is order everything, develop things thoroughly, maybe be very very considerate about the tech, about the what changes you're making to your cryptographic architecture and you know, getting the best people in the industry to work on it. You know, sometimes even auditing isn't good enough or is questionable. Like, because for example, like with the kind of cryptography we're developing, you know, like who, who can, who can audit advanced ultra plunk circuits? I mean, like, you know, I can count the number of people that I trust to do that on the fingers of both my hands and they're all busy with their own projects. So, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's one of the, one of these issues that's, that can only really be solved with, time and attention. I could add one thing as well. It's it's about the the amount of the protocol uh, for kind of if you if you take the iPhone developer example, like how much of what they're building needs to be in noir and requires those kind of like fundamental privacy guarantees. Like how much of it is can be written at layer one, um kind of in in terms of like just written in solidity. Um and it's about assembling that kind of stack of that uh, I guess different uh, kind of languages and, and, and different pieces of technology to get the end product that the users need. And I think trying to do that all in kind of noir on day one would probably lead to a lot of catastrophic bugs, but doing bits of it um, in noir to give the privacy that's required, bits of it in solidity, bits of it don't need to be on chain. And I think um, there's a lot of kind of learnings in the space generally from 2017 where people were planning on putting social networks on chain and, and all these things that were meant to be built on, on a blockchain that don't need to live there. Um, so I think it's about kind of careful design of, of what needs to live where in, in the stack and um, uh, that will kind of evolve over time and more things will be in the pri private end. That's kind of our bet. Uh, but it's about making sure the right things are in the right place um, to kind of do damage limitation in case something does go wrong. Oh, cool. And like, you know, trying to mitigate the foot guns so you're aware of, like, you know, that they'll make it harder to make an accident. That, uh, I guess actually a question from this that appears a lot in, like, the Snark DSLs is that, uh, like, how much do you expose, like, Snark optimizations, like, uh, in the language? Like, do you, exp uh, just want the big ones, like, non-determinism, or, like, if I know the answer to an if statement, do, do I just, how, how can I use that instead of computing the answer? Or, or, but I guess in your case, it's actually a lot more, like with all the uh, turbo plonk and like, lookup table work. So is is a general approach that you want to hide this complexity, or you want to like give it as as available to like advanced developers? The first step is to is to hide it all away because it produces a simpler language. We can then move from that to the next phase, which is to gradually expose the some of the inner workings to to advanced developers who want to play around with it. The, the approach that we're currently taking is in-house. We, we're writing for the common algorithms that people use SNARKs for. So, you know, things like binary arithmetic, inter arithmetic, um, you know, hashing algorithms, elliptic curve arithmetic, um, digital signatures, that kind of thing. We're writing our own highly efficient optimized gadgets uh, that use the latest plonk and lookup table techniques that have a very, very small number of constraints. And then those are getting exposed in the language as um, primitive, op like like primitive opcodes. So you know, like in noir, you can you can do a sha five six hash of a, of a string, and that sha five six call will go be piped directly into our optimized widget. And so that's that's kind of how we're abstracting with the complexity by by giving people these these common building blocks that are already pre optimized. And the idea is then that the the all of the complex heavy lifting is done by our by our optimized widgets and. Um, what's actually programmed in noir is more is close to glue logic that ties these components together. Oh, cool! That, that makes sense. And then, like, yeah, hiding this complexity by you building the expensive components that people are tempted to rewrite themselves. Exactly. We, yeah, we saw it a lot. I mean, a lot of projects kind of um, would have their own hash implementations, and kind of it's it's everyone doing the same work. Um, and having a reference implementation, I think, longer term is definitely the the right approach here. Um, but it, it needs to be open source. It needs to be kind of reviewed by everyone and and we're we're getting to that step um for it to be kind of trusted so what's your call to action to our audience and uh where can people find you yeah i think um right now if you if you want to do private transactions head to head to zk.money uh, and over the coming uh, six eight weeks we'll be upgrading uh the ui to enable you to do all of your favorite DeFi interactions with strong privacy guarantees so we're, we're looking for kind of 
uh, feedback on, on the early version of that over the coming months and uh, for developers uh, we've also got a test net if you're, if you're keen to write out uh, your own DeFi bridge contracts then head over to our Discord um, we'll put links in the uh, in the description um, after and we can uh, kind of provide you with some docs to help build some of these DeFi bridges to make these private interactions possible yeah we will be curious on a group side you know head, head to our Discord head to our GitHub um, check out Noir play around with it uh, we're always searching for more feedback well thanks a lot for coming on and uh, we'll look forward to uh have you having you guys on again at some point in the future to uh, dive deeper into how things are progressing? Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having us. It's been great. And Dave, congratulations on your first uh, on your first interview. Uh, how did you like it? Thanks. It was really fun. I mean, uh, Aztec's one of my favorite projects. So it was uh, very cool to learn about more of the details of how uh, they're getting privacy in ETH right now. It was fun being on the side of a podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you did an excellent job. So we'll hopefully uh, we'll be able to do this uh, many more times. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>